Hola, muy buenos días, buenas tardes. Good morning and good afternoon from the headquarters of the Pan American Health Organization, PAHO, in Washington, D.C. Welcome to this press briefing on the pandemic due to COVID-19 in the Americas. Today is Wednesday, uh, November 24, 2021. My name is Luciana Viegas, public affairs consultant of PAHO. We have interpretation into English, Spanish, French, and Portuguese as every week, and you can find the option in the globe icon. You will be able to ask questions using the Q&A button, and please remember to give your name and the outlet when you uh, write in your questions. Today, Dr. Carissa Tien, director of PAHO, will say a few words about the situation of PAHO in the Americas. Dr. Etienne is accompanied by Dr. Jarbal Barbosa, Assistant Director of PAHO, Dr. Ciro Garde, Director of the Department of Health Emergencies, and Dr. Al Tigieri, Sylvain Altigieri, Incident Manager for COVID-19. We will begin with Dr. Etienne's remarks, and then we will have questions to the Q&A and other questions that we have received um, yesterday. Dr. Etienne. Good morning to all of you, and thanks for joining today's press briefing. Over the last week, we witnessed a 23% jump in new cases in our region. There were 880,583 new COVID infections and more than 15,000 COVID-related deaths reported in the Americas in the past week. Most new cases took place in North America, where both the United States and Canada are reporting increasing COVID incidence rates. Canada's Yukon and Northwest Territories saw a two to three-fold increase in new infections over the last week. In contrast, Central America saw a 37% reduction in new infections. Yet in South America, nearly every country except Brazil, Suriname, and Venezuela is reporting increasing COVID incidence with the highest jumps in the last week occurring in Ecuador and Paraguay. In the Bolivian Department of Santa Cruz, cases have increased by 400% following recent strikes and protests that also prevented people from accessing COVID vaccination and testing sites. Meanwhile, Colombia's tourist centers like Bogota and Medellin are reporting a rise in cases and hospitalizations, especially among younger people. The Southern Cone countries of Chile and Argentina are also seeing a rise in new cases. In the Caribbean, Trinidad and Tobago is experiencing its highest ever COVID rates, and at least five of its hospitals are at over 80% capacity. Barbados, the Cayman Islands, and the Dominican Republic are also reporting high rates of new infections. These trends are telling. Even though COVID cases have dropped significantly over the last few months, COVID transmission is still active across our region. So every time we lower our guard, the virus gains momentum. Before we proceed, I want to take a moment to comment on the trends we're seeing in Europe and what that means for us in the Americas. Through this pandemic, Europe has been a window into the future for the Americas. Time and again, we've seen how the infection dynamics in Europe are mirrored here several weeks later. And over the last weeks, many European countries have reported record numbers of new cases. In Eastern Europe, relatively lower vaccination coverage has led to an increase in cases. While many Western European countries have achieved substantial vaccination coverage, they still have significant pockets of unvaccinated people. And in many cases, 
public health measures have been relaxed, creating the perfect environment for this virus to spread. The future is unfolding before us, and it must be a wake up call for our region because we are even more vulnerable. While 51% of people across Latin America and the Caribbean have been fully vaccinated against COVID-19, there are 19 countries in our region that have not reached the WHO targets to vaccinate 40% of the population of every country by the end of this year and 70% by mid-2022. Even though vaccination coverage is not as high as we'd hoped, in many densely populated areas of the Americas, preventive measures have been lifted or relaxed. And, and this is a worrisome combination that keeps us vulnerable to the virus and threatens our hard fought gains. With the approaching holidays and upcoming summer vacations in the Southern Hemisphere, I wish to take a moment to remind everyone that our individual and collective decisions chart the path of this pandemic. We have been here before. Our region witnessed a large jump in new cases following last year's holiday season. And it took months for countries to reduce the incidence of new cases. This year, we are better off than the last for one simple reason we have more tools to protect ourselves from this virus. And that's why today I want to urge two main messages. The first is that vaccines work. The WHO has authorized eight COVID-19 vaccines that are safe and effective against the virus. Other vaccines have also been approved by national regulatory authorities in several countries. Our hospitals offer the best proof of the power of these vaccines. Mere months ago, hospital beds and intensive care units across our region were at capacity, leaving many COVID patients with nowhere to turn. But over the last year, more than 1.3 billion COVID-19 vaccine doses have been administered in the Americas, giving us protection against serious COVID illness that will often require hospitalization. Where most of the population is immunized, these vaccines have helped to lower the hospital bed occupancy. PAHO is working to expand vaccine access in the region, especially in places that are falling behind. But as we have said time and time again, vaccines are not the only tool to protect us against COVID. And that's why the last point I want to stress is that public health measures are key to reducing the spread of this virus. Mask wearing, social distancing, and avoiding large gatherings, especially indoors, will remain important, even as more of us get vaccinated. There is no room for complacency because we've already faced the consequences of an uncontrolled pandemic, and we don't want to be in that position again. As we enter the time of year for reflection and celebration, give a gift to your friends and family by getting vaccinated when it's your turn. If you are planning on seeing loved ones this season, keep your gatherings small to the extent possible and outdoors when you can. If you must gather inside, open your windows so air can circulate. For anyone who is planning to pack their bags, please get vaccinated before you leave. And don't forget to wear a mask during your trip and to follow the public health guidance at your destination. The decisions that we take over the next few months will determine the course of the next year. It is really up to all of us to make smart and safe choices this holiday season so we can protect ourselves and each other from the virus.
Thank you, Dr. Aitan, for this timely and important message. Uh, a follow-up to this, you said we should make smart and safe uh, choices this holiday season. Could you expand on what those are? So let me thank you for this question. The smartest thing you can do now is to get your COVID-19 vaccine as soon as you are eligible and when it is available in your country. Please don't hesitate because of something you heard or read on the internet. We want to assure you that the vaccines are safe and will substantially reduce your chance of getting sick or even dying from this disease. If you have not been vaccinated yet, take the holidays as a good opportunity to book a vaccine appointment and if needed, or, or, or go to a pharmacy or clinic where vaccines are available. Because with the vaccine, you are much more likely to spend the holidays and the coming months in better health without severe COVID-19. You will avoid being a cause of worry and grief for your family and friends, and you will help your community by staying out of the hospital. However, as we stated before, remember that being vaccinated is not a reason to be complacent and to give up on other measures. What we found out is that there is no magic bullet per se to stop COVID-19. So we ask people to do it all, do everything that you need to do, get vaccinated, wear a mask in public places, and where physical distances cannot be maintained in indoor places with poor ventilation, um, protect yourself, respect physical distance. Let's, let's, be, let's be sure about this, the virus is not taking a holiday and neither can we. This is a dangerous, wily disease that has already killed more than 5 million people around the world and has infected over 254 million. Please don't become a statistic by relaxing your precautions. Thank you very much, Dr. Tian. For this additional information, um, pasamos entonces a las preguntas. Now we go to our questions and we begin with a question from Mar Romero Sala, journalist from uh, France 24, uh, regarding the vaccines. How have bilateral agreements advanced with pharmaceutical companies to purchase directly vaccines con against uh, COVID-19 to be distributed in Latin America and the Caribbean? And the second question is, what is a, your um, opinion about COVAX in the region? Thank you for your questions. Yes, uh, PAHO negotiations with uh, pharmaceutical companies continue underway and well advanced. We have agreements signed with three AstraZeneca, uh, Sinovac and Sinopharma, and we're about to uh, com uh, complete another agreement with another um, mRNA vaccine. This, uh, they're yet to confirm the amounts of for the countries. The more countries participate in this effort, the better the prices will be. And I think this will be very important to have by 2022 more vaccines available for the region. So we continue to have conversations with each one of the countries which submitted their interest to come to um, the amount. And this is a supplementary alternative to the COVAX mechanism and to the agreements with the countries in order to be able to offer to the countries all choices so that they can reach a high vaccine coverage, which is essential to control transmission. Regarding the COVAX facility, I think it will be very important for countries to make a good assessment of what's going on. The facility is very important to guarantee equitable access. COVAX mechanism has already provided uh, hundreds of millions of doses of vaccines, which for poor countries, for low-income countries, 
makes a tremendous difference because I don't know what other alternative they would have if it were not through the COVAX facility. But at the same time, without having a rule or a global agreement about equitable access, the truth is that vaccine manufacturers have prioritized bilateral agreements with high income countries, rich countries, and those who are more developed. This because they can set their prices uh, at higher when they sell it to these countries. The COVAX mechanism has also had some difficulties and challenges. challenges. Uh, the Serum Institute uh, manufacturer, which had uh, agreed to provide 500,000 doses by 2021, had all uh, exports uh, banned during most of the year. The Janssen product that had uh, committed 200 million, they have only uh, shipped 5% of that. And uh, they have increased uh, deliveries in the last quarter. In September, more uh, deliveries uh, through COVAX were eight, were uh, possible thanks to donations. So uh, there has been an increase of um, a, a twofold increase in the last quarter, and we hope that it will continue to increase. In summary, COVAX is an important facility. However, if there is no proposal, no agreement for manufacturers to be able to take into account that they should more equitable distribute their production, those mechanisms will never achieve the goals that are necessary to achieve. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Barbosa. We have some questions from Mexico as well. We begin with Melina Ochoa, a reporter from UNO TV. Melina asks, last Friday, the health secretary of Mexico, Dr. Dr. Alcocer Varela reported that there are uh, some indications, small indications of a fourth wave of coronavirus in Mexico. Um, Dr. Ugarte, do you think that there will be a fourth wave in Mexico of COVID-19? Dr. Ugarte, thank you. This question applies to other countries too. Let me remind you that during the course of this pandemic, we saw that at different times and in different geographic areas of the countries, there have been increases in cases or outbreaks, which um, are, have been related to relaxing protection measures, and in particular, in those areas that have low coverage against COVID-19. In Mexico, recently, we have seen a uh, a jump in cases, new cases and deaths, especially in non-vaccinated people. And even though the number of active cases was was um, has stabilized around 18,000 in the next last two weeks, we need to understand that what happened last year in, during the same time in Mexico for the holidays and uh, commercial, family and social events increase. And when it is harder to maintain physical distance and be wearing your masks on a permanent basis and at times where uh, the population or significant numbers of the population is not fully vaccinated against COVID-19, this led to a large number of cases and deaths in December of last year and January of this year. So in this sense, let me reiterate what the director just told us. And she was very clear about this. At this time of year, it is essential to maintain uh, prevention measures and promote vaccination uh, in the countries. And I would ask Dr. Aldegheri to uh, complement this question is he, if he sees fit. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ugarte. I would say that uh, the main characteristic of this pandemic continues to be uncertainty uh, in its evolution, and this should lead us uh, to be cautious regarding the evolution of the pandemic. I would also like to make a reference to 
the remarks of Dr. Etienne regarding the increase in cases that is happening in Europe. In fact, this is due to several factors, including relaxation of the public health control measures within a context of high coverages of vaccination in countries in West Western Europe. However, there are uh, lower vaccination rates in certain areas of Eastern Europe. I would limit um, my remarks to what I have just said. Thank you very much. Over. Thank you, Dr. Aldegheri. A question related to the um, Delta variant from uh, Blanca Valadez from the Grupo Milenio Mexico. The question is uh, reflecting upon what's going on in Europe regarding the Delta situation, which had not circulated in some case, uh, in some countries, as was the case in Mexico. Could there be another mutation in the virus which will uh, lead uh, us to um, uh, imperil our gains with respect to vaccination. Yes, Dr. Aldegheri. Yes, of course, we have the situation in Europe. Even circulation of the Delta variant con constitutes an additional factor at this point in time. We do not consider this as the most relevant factor to explain the um, increase in incidence in Europe. Let's remember that both globally and regionally, the Delta variant is pre predominantly and practically the only one circulating, and therefore it is to be expected that it is this variant, the one responsible for the outbreaks and cases that continue to appear in the countries. On the other hand, according to the patterns of evolution that we've seen in recent weeks, it is possible that the SARS-CoV-2 virus is reaching a plateau where the genome becomes stabilized and even though it continues to evolve, mutations are uh, less and less frequent and changes less critical for epidemiological uh, behavior. The process that we have observed with the, the sub-lineages of the Delta variant variant allow us to infer that even though it is still very transmissible, it is not evolving toward uh, toward variants that are serious or that are not afforded protection through the vaccine. For this reason, we need to maintain the genomic uh, surveillance of the virus and be on the lookout for things that may alter the vaccine's efficacy. And a reflection which always uh, which we have always emphasized in these um, press briefings is that the most effective way to prevent appearance of new variants is to limit uh, transmission by maintaining strict measures of public health. Um, and I hope I have answered this other question from Mexico. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Aldegheri, for clarifying issues about variants. Another question from Mexico now with the vaccination coverage. Patricia Rodriguez Calva from Grupo Imagen in Mexico says, Mexico has reported 80, 84% of its adult population vaccinated with one or two doses. Is this coverage enough to confront a fourth wave now that the winter is upon us? or should they increase their vaccination percentage? Dr. Barbosa, thank you for your question. And uh, to, uh, for any wave, it is necessary to have vaccination and not only one dose. I saw the question speaks about one or two doses as if it were the same thing, but it's not the same. In order to have full protection, people have to take the two doses for those um, vaccines that require two doses. Mexico has made a significant effort to vaccinate its population. They have achieved 50% of the population fully vaccinated with two doses. So it is significant vaccine coverage, but it is not enough to guarantee that the country may not have other outbreaks, just as the uh, Secretary of Health mentioned. So first of all, we need to continue with vaccination to reach a higher um, 
coverage, uh, vaccination coverage, full coverage, that is, and secondly, to maintain public health measures. What we have seen in many European countries is that even if you have 60, 65 percent vaccination coverage, you can see an increase in number of cases, especially significant increases in cases. You cannot imagine that the decrease in cases that many countries in Latin America are currently seeing is a sign that this is the end of the pandemic and that uh, vaccination coverages of 40, 50, 60 percent are enough uh, and that nobody will ever have uh, a wave again. No, this is not true. You need to continue to vaccinate, giving full schedule vaccinations and maintaining public health measures at the same time as a significant um, surveillance and major surveillance to identify whether there are uh, ten trends to the increase in uh, the transmission of the country. Question from Panama, uh, from Cardenas, uh, from La Prensa. In recent weeks, Panama has been, has been seeing an increase in cases as well. What is the evaluation of PAHO regarding the situation and what do we recommend to the country's authorities, Dr. Ogarte? Thank you very much, Luciana. Thank you very much, Henry, for this question. La uh, 214 cases reported by PAN, no new deaths. This is an important increase of index cases and the positive rates, but this is still be below to are very close to control. However, it is very important to consider all muy alta. Cuando se relaja las medidas, se incrementa that we heard before las personas que no han sido vacunadas y se hospitalicen, inclusive fallezcan. In populations that have very high rate of vaccination, whenever measures of which to have infected would happen among people that have incomplete vaccinations or that have not been vaccinated at all. In the case of Panama, the information available indicates that there is a tiene la vacunación completa. About 79% of individuals that are that have full vaccination at the same time. We should remember what Dr. Etienne said and Dr. Jarba said. It is necessary to maintain protection measures, in particular, when after a long time we have the opportunity to meet again, to also carry out activities that we used to do more freely, but also to consider that that is an opportunity for the virus, for the virus to infect more individuals and eventually kill those that are unvaccinated. So it is a responsibility of the health authorities that is to say to maintain this together with proper communication and also to provide more spaces for those individuals who are not vaccinated to vaccinate themselves. But the most important responsibility is for all of us. It is key to maintain these measures at all times, in particular, if we want to take care of ourselves, our families and the communities. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ugarte. Now we move on to a question on a vaccine, CoronaVac in English. Uh, this is a question by Tobias Koifer. Uh, about Brazil, do you have actual information about the efficiency of the vaccine CoronaVac? And uh, could it be one reason for the positive developments of the situation in Brazil? Dr. Barbosa? Thank, thank you for this question. Brazil is using uh, several different vaccines. It's not the only CoronaVac. Brazil is using CoronaVac, is using AstraZeneca vaccine, and is using Pfizer and Janssen. So what is happening in Brazil and other countries in, in Latin America is that Brazil is increasing the, the vaccination coverage in a very important way. Just to, to, to tell you one, one figure, Brazil has vaccinated so far 
of the adults at 60 and more. And they have vaccinated around the almost 65% of the adults uh, at the 18 to 59 years. So it's a very important and homogeneous uh, coverage that reflects the, the, the trust, uh, the experience that the national immunization programs in Brazil, in Argentina, in Chile, in Peru, in Colombia, in Mexico, and many other countries uh, have in Latin America in the Caribbean. So I think that what's happening is that the vaccination is increasing. At the same time, many public health measures have been adopted. I, I was reading a newspaper last week saying that a very important percentage, around 90% of people in Brazil, are informing that they are, uh, they are keeping wearing masks when they go outside. So this is a, a combination of these things. Probably there is also an hypothesis that the, the contained, uh, the, the sustained transmission that we had in Brazil and other Latin American countries. And the, if, if you remember, for many months we had the transmission. It was not a peak, a wave. It was a, a plateau with many months of continued transmission. This also can provided some additional protection, but this is an hypothesis. We cannot take it for granted. We cannot relax the measures because the cost, if this hypothesis is not confirmed, is that we will face a new wave with more cases, more deaths. So it's important to keep the public health measures. It is very important to keep a very, uh, a very, strong, a very strong surveillance. Uh, it's important to to, to offer tests to the, to the population. So all the, the, the policies and strategies that we are recommended need to be uh, working now. As the director mentioned, the pandemic is not over yet in Brazil and in any country in Latin America and the Caribbean. So it's very important to, to keep the vaccination, to keep the public health uh, measures and to be vigilant. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias, Dr. Barbosa. Uh, pasamos Thank a you, pregunta. Dr. Barbosa. Now we move on to a question about the post-COVID syndrome. Violeta Villar from the Web Health is asking, are the health systems prepared to serve those who are suffering post-COVID syndrome and also it's a weakening effect? Thank you very much for the question. This is Dr. Aldigieri. I think that in previous press briefings, we had started to share our position in connection with the post-COVID condition that, as a matter of fact, is the subsequent phase of the, of the infection. It usually happens three months after the initiation of the acute disease with symptoms that may last up to two months and more. So it has to do with the complexity of management by the health systems of those uh, patients that have persistent symptoms that are changing their daily lives and also have some limitations in their care, mobility, and return to work. PAHO's experts have defined three aspects as key to manage the post-COVID condition. Acknowledgement, treatment, and rehabilitation. Within this context, the health systems in the region are organizing their systems to care for those patients that have post-COVID condition. And PAHO is also working with the countries to strengthen those areas and also to make sure that the health services have the capacity to address the needs of individuals that have the post-COVID syndrome. However, the capacity of the systems to address this increased demand of services is lim limited by the interruptions in the provision of health services for all sorts of conditions. And this is what we have observed for the last 
22 months. This includes a reduction in the demand and also provision of priority services such as mental health and also the care of the elderly and individuals with disabilities, rehabilitation, non-communicable diseases, among others. And it is important to mention that the first level of care, that is to say the one that is closest to the individuals is key to follow up patients who have the post COVID syndrome and also to enhance access to those individuals for those individuals who are vulnerable. Special care should be provided for strengthening services related to mental health and also psychosocial services. It is a key element for health services. Everything that has to do with human resources, that is to say the comprehensive care for those uh, patients with co post-COVID syndrome, they do need multidisciplinary teams that are adequate in numbers with the skills and the proper abilities. So priority should be given to infections at the first level of care, including in connection with infrastructure, ancillary services, health infrastructure, hiring and also the recruitment and also the preservation of these individuals in their po in their in the fulfillment of their responsibilities so that they can care for those patients that have the post covid condition i hope i have addressed the questions by the journalist thank you thank you dr andigieri we have other questions from the countries one of them is from peru in connection with the uh, with what to do with for the is asking in peru new restrictions are being implemented such as not having unvaccinated individuals go into uh, closed spaces and also the implementation of a vaccination card. Does PAHO consider that these measures are key to motivate vaccination? And there is a second question by Jason in connection with the budgets to face the pandemic next year, whether we have a position that the countries will be needing more budget to face the pandemic. Dr. Barbosa, you may have a general question, a general answer to this question. Thank you very much. Peru has also been making a tremendous effort to cover the unvaccinated. They have vaccinated more than 50% of their population with at least two doses or a full, a full cycle of the vaccine but once again this is not enough we need to look for all of the strategies that the government of peru is doing to enhance this uh, vaccination coverage we need to think about it with the vaccines that we can. many countries are also implementing internal limitations and restrictions for unvaccinated individuals and this is a decision to be made by each country based on their own laws and regulations we understand that the largest goal is to indicate that a person that has the ability to get vaccinated and decides not to vaccinate is an individual that could risk not only his own health but also the health and the life of other individuals and their colleagues at work, as well as individuals who are at the restaurant, for example, where that person may go or in a market or supermarket. So that is leading some countries to implement these restrictions under their own rules and regulations. What we are strongly recommending here from PAHO is to continue with a communication strategy that could clarify any doubts. It is not that some people are against vaccines, but sometimes there are fake news in social media and they also listen to pieces of information that are untrue about the vaccine. So it is important to have a communication strategy that can reach out to the communities, all of the health professionals, so that vaccines can continue to be part of the government's effort and to attain high coverage. As to the second section of this question, PAHO has also called the attention to a report that has been launched together with ECLAC on the need to have 
a broader look at the health situation, the economy and society. The pandemic is not only a health problem, it is also a social economic problem of significance, but it is not possible to fully recover the economy if the pandemic is not under control. So there is no opposition, quite the contrary. We think it is important to take into account the, that economy and health should be properly coordinated. PAHU is also recommending, and WHO is also recommending for countries to spend about 6% of their GDP to guarantee that health services are more resilient and that they can also offer coverage of services and access to services for all of the population. So we do understand that the countries are going to need further resources next year to be able to combat the pandemic, and they will also need resources to strengthen their health systems and services to continue to vaccinate those kids that, that are, were unvaccinated because of the pandemic and those uh, women, for example, that were not diagnosed early of uh, cervical cancer. So it is important to find the most efficient, the most efficacious measures that can provide the best benefit to the population. PAHO is working with the countries precisely to increase technical cooperation and also is recommending the best measures, the most efficacious measures, so that all of the health budgets can be properly used with the best return on health, that is the improvement of the population's health. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Barbosa. We have another question that is a follow-up question from Nicaragua regarding the variants. Lydia Lopez from La Prensa is asking, upon confirming the existence of all of the variants of concern in Nicaragua, which is the one that is prevalent in the country? Dr. Aldiguieri? Yes, clearly, it's a pleasure. The National Reference Diagnostic Center of the Ministry of Nicaragua has informed us of the variants of concern that are circulating in Nicaragua in the last couple of months. The four variants of concern have been detected in Nicaragua. It is very important to mention that worldwide and regionally and at the level of Central America, as well as in Nicaragua in particular, the variant of concern that is circulating is the Delta variant. That is the only variant that is being detected and confirmed and sequenced in the country. And that variant, let me add, has uh, some specific details. It is of high, it has a high transmission index. That is to say, whenever there is community transmission, transmission is very significant, in particular among the unvaccinated purpose of that question, as well as in the other countries in Central America, the variant that has been predominantly identified is the Delta variant. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aldiguiri. We are reaching the end of our session today. We're going to move on to another topic. Violence against women and girls. Uh, a question for Dr. Etienne. As a final question, uh, what are the effects uh, of COVID-19 on violence against women? Dr. Etienne. Th thank you for... Um, moving to, to this topic. So thanks for the question. Uh, this question is timely because tomorrow is International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women and Girls. It is also the first of 16 days of activism against gender-based violence, which is an annual campaign to raise awareness of the burden of violence and mobilizes all of society to act to eliminate violence. In the context of COVID-19, what we have seen is increased urgency for action 
on violence in the home, especially against women and their children. Violence against women is a major public health and human rights challenge in the Americas with enormous health, social and economic consequences. Due to the lockdowns and other movement restrictions to combat the pandemic, women and their children who are already living with violence are at particular risk as they are spending more time in the home. Research by the United Nations Population Fund, UNFPA, projected 15 million extra cases of gender-based violence globally for every three months of lockdown. Staggering numbers. A WHO Pulse survey showed that 39% of countries globally reported disruptions to services for intimate partner and sexual violence prevention and response services. During the pandemic, many women have been forced to leave their jobs to take care of their families with obviously a negative effect on both their income and well-being. Stay at home measures coupled with economic stresses have increased the risk of violence and social exclusion. We have an evidence based on what works to prevent and respond to violence. And some, advanced, some examples of these are the respect and inspire tools that contain several strategies based on the best available evidence and with the greatest potential to prevent violence. And one of them is the economic empowerment of women. As countries continue to face the effects of the pandemic, we repeat our clarion call. Violence against women, no matter where it occurs, is deplorable and totally unacceptable. Ending violence against women is a human right and public health priority. Really, we need everyone, women and men, to become active for these changes to occur and to thrive. Let's take care of our women, let's take care of our society, and let's build our economy. Thank you very much, Dr. Tien, for those final words uh, on a very important topic and some stark statistics. Uh, llegamos ahora al final de nuestra sesión por hoy. Muchas gracias a todos los periodistas uh, por conectarse con nosotros. Uh, la información, la sesión, uh, tenemos la grabación en nuestro sitio web, en la página All de la OPE. All of the journalists who join us today, the information on this set, as well as the recording will be available on our website, www.pajo.org. And then clearly, if you have any questions, all the questions by using the Q&A button. If, you have, if we have not addressed them, please do email them to mediateam at pajo.org. And we shall see you next week. Thank you very much. And see you then.